Coming up on 21st Century. Can virtual reality create empathy in a humanitarian crisis? And urban refugees in Kenya striving for a life of dignity. A new technology takes you into the heart of a scene. Virtual reality, breaking new barriers. It's working on your brain in ways that I don't think is really completely understood. But can it be used for more than just entertainment? They come out of it very deeply moved. I'd say half the people who watch cry. Using virtual reality to create empathy in a humanitarian crisis, one viewer at a time. Humanitarian crises are all too familiar to television viewers. Civil wars that cause huge movements of refugees, worldwide pandemics, and natural disasters like earthquakes and tsunamis. This is the way most of us are used to seeing these heart-wrenching events, on a screen in front of us, watching passively. But what if you could step into the frame and actually feel what it's like for the individuals on the ground? People come out of it feeling enlightened and often moved and often ready to take action. A lot of people automatically say, well, what can I do? How can I get involved? Garbo Aurora is a creative director leading a team at the United Nations who are using cutting edge technology to raise awareness, empathy and funds both to respond to humanitarian crises and to bolster support for a new set of sustainable development goals around the globe. Virtual reality is the ability to really take part in a story that usually you're only a passive spectator on. And it's giving you the possibility to walk in another person's shoes, understand where they live, see what their world is like, and you actually get the sensation of feeling like you're being there. Depicting virtual reality in a 2D medium, such as the one you see on your screen right now, will never truly represent what it's like when viewing VR through a headset. By using multiple cameras that can record in all directions and software that can stitch the images together, virtual reality creates an experience that enables the viewer to see a movie from every angle above, below, and behind. It's exciting for the UN you know, to be involved in some of those early experiments of how we're trying to tell stories, make these films, and, and work with some of the most cutting edge people in the industry on it. So the UN reached out to us and connected, and we realized that there was a great opportunity here to tell some very important stories and to tell them in a way that we thought uh, would be totally new and, and highly impactful. Aaron Koblen, a technologist working in Silicon Valley, is the co-founder of Verse, a virtual reality production and distribution company. It usually consists uh, in the portable form of a mobile phone that connects directly into a viewer. So whether that's a higher end version like the Gear VR by Samsung or a Google Cardboard unit, you have basically the same idea, the lenses which are having, using sensors to orient you and convince yourself that you're somewhere where you're not. This is the most basic VR viewer. It's a Google Cardboard. So if you, it comes like this, and then you quickly assemble it like so. Drop your phone in here, like that, so you can look around and actually be immersed. The way that I define virtual reality at this point in time is basically the hacking of your senses to convince you that you're somewhere other than where you are. Often. I think of it as a sense of vulnerability. So one of the things we've realized in, in some of our stories is you have a heightened sense of empathy and a heightened sense of connection as a result of that vulnerability. That heightened sense of connection and empathy was exactly what Garbo Aurora was looking to create at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Not only to inspire leaders to take action, but also to influence donors to increase funding for disaster response efforts. 
I started experimenting with using innovative ways of advocacy. And I started talking to a lot of different partners and people. What could we do that would be incredible? And someone said, you know, I just came from a meeting at Samsung and, you know, with some of these other virtual reality headsets. Wouldn't it be amazing if you got all of those elite people who could actually go to a refugee camp or they could go to an Ebola clinic? I just really felt it would get our issues highlighted. One of the things we were most excited about was the potential to get these headsets onto heads that, that really make the decisions and, and have impact in the world. We were able to put it on the heads of these change makers and for a brief moment put them you know, uh, on the ground in the refugee camp. And it, it's, I think, a really powerful thing. You could see the way that it was impacting them. In addition to the screenings at Davos, virtual reality portals have been set up to view the films at high-level political forums around the world. One of the leaders who made use of a VR portal was Samantha Power, United States Ambassador to the United Nations. So what the portal does is it, it doesn't just give you those faces, it's not you know, just what you feel, you're, you're right there. The virtual reality film that she watched was Clouds Over Cedra. Clouds Over Cedra is a short film in virtual reality about a girl named Sidra who lives in Zatari camp, which is a Syrian refugee camp in Jordan. And it is a story about a young girl who has been there for a year and a half and is giving you a tour of the camp, of what it's like, what her life is like. When the film debuted in Davos, it was a sensation to everyone we showed it to. They come out of it uh, very deeply moved. Um, I'd say half the people who watch Clouds of Procedure cry. We're seeing generally a much higher level of engagement. I mean, one, because they're actively engaged in looking around, but also, I think, a higher level of emotional connection and empathy. The film was then integrated with the Secretary General in the Kuwait Pledging Conference for Syria. He made everyone at the reception at the Pledging Conference watch it, and it really made a big difference on getting people to pledge more and to care more and to be more involved. And then we cut a version for UNICEF for its face-to-face -face fundraisers. The way they do that is usually someone with a clipboard on the street in Europe or in different countries. So they thought, well, what if we got people to experience virtual reality on the street? I was a little depressed about the situation for the people there. Quite sad. They do have a good environment to stay. We try our best to help them. Early reporting from UNICEF has shown that when using virtual reality, they've doubled the effectiveness of their fundraising efforts. The fact that virtual reality is so real means that we have to think a lot more about the ethical aspects of what we do. Tom Kent is the standards editor at the Associated Press and is a professor at New York's Columbia University. There's a psychological impact that VR has that's greater than the impact of photos or video. It hits you at a more elemental level. When somebody's watching a video or someone's looking at a photo, they know that they are external to the scene and they're looking in at something. VR operates at a different level. It's putting you in the scene and working on your brain in ways that I don't think is really completely understood. We got the blessing to do one on Ebola. Waves of Grace is an Ebola survivor who is basically, you get access to her prayer and you feel like you have this intimate moment with her as she's praying to God. Waves of Grace was integrated into the UN Secretary General's International Ebola Recovery Conference, which garnered 5.2 billion US dollars in pledges. What people really feel moved by is they've never been in a, a, a poor slum, in a hut. They've never been at an Ebola burying site. So many people said that they've seen that picture in the news, but actually being there while a body is being buried is, is something else. It makes you think about this crisis and 
other crises in a different way. The most important thing is transparency. If the VR producer is trying to advance a political cause or a social cause, that needs to be made clear. I think one just has to be really open and clear about one's methods. We're going to constantly be evolving and thinking about these ethics even more as we go forward. We privilege the human story. You know, it isn't so much the UN did this and this is what's happening and this is what you should do. It really is a quiet sort of, let's put yourself in the shoes of another. But it definitely is something that we are just at the beginning of. Being at the forefront of it, especially for the United Nations, gives us a lot of advantages to tell our stories and make a difference with a whole new generation of viewers, and especially a lot of young people. Because if we didn't do what we do with virtual reality, it would fill up with games and escapism. When a 15-year-old would unwrap his Christmas present a year from now or two years from now, he wouldn't have Clouds of Sudra and this UN series there for him. life here. Our life is very hard. Being a refugee is not a life and we don't have a country. More than half of the world's 10 million refugees live in cities. Why the urban refugees are here? They, they've not made a, a choice to come. They've, they were forced at some point to leave their houses, their loved ones, everything that they had to, for their safety and they've ended up in Nairobi. In Kenya, urban refugees and their struggle for acceptance. Nobody respects you as a refugee guy. If you go to town, you're afraid of the, of the police, you're afraid of the, even the people. They look at you differently. We don't have life here. Our life is very hard. Being a refugee is not a life. And we don't have a country. I wish, I wish we have a, I have a country. And all the refugees, they have a country. If there's a beast in every country, there's no refugee. But you see, expect it tomorrow, it will happen in your country. What will you do if you become a refugee? What will you do? You will face the same life we, we are facing now. Not less than that. The mandate of UNHCR, as you know, is to protect refugees and to find solutions. So as a way to protect urban refugees and refugees in general, we make sure that they are first of all identified as such and they are properly documented. As asylum seekers or refugees with the documentation, they are protected against refoulement, which means that the Kenyan authorities will not send them back to their country of origin or to another country where they could also be persecuted and people who've been granted refugee status get an identification refugee card issued by the National Registration Bureau. The overwhelming majority of urban refugees are self-sufficient. They are not being assisted by UNHCR or its partners. We only assist the most, most vulnerable people. So most of the urban refugees work, take care of themselves, and are not dependent on, the, on any aid. Ma. Ma. Nobody respects you as a refugee guy. If you go to town, you're afraid of the, of the police, you're afraid of the, even the people. They look at you differently. It feels terrible. 
We are just human beings, like you guys. Hmm? We deserve the life you live, not less than that. The way the people treat us, not being different guy, they saw us as a different person. They saw us like we don't, we don't belong to this world. But, but God created us. What do we do? I wish people treat us like a human being, respect us as a human being, live a, like, like as a human being. That's what I wish. Is this our kitchen? This is our bedroom. This is our bedroom. This is where I, I, I sleep. This is where I sleep. Come on in. This is our sitting room. This is our refugee house. This is where the refugee lives. Bathroom, mother. It's a refugee house. I show you some papers prove that something terrible happened to my wife, which is I don't want any to mention in front of the camera. So if it's good for me to to show you the papers, so you can read for yourself. These are the papers. I came in Italy, in Nairobi, 18 years back. These patients were different than the ones I, I was having during my lifetime experience. Most of them are refugees from Somalia or Ethiopia. We saw that most of them are complaining of pain, different parts of in the body. We give them treatment. After a few days, again, they are reappearing. No change in their symptoms. It's at that time we consulted a professor who was our friend and uh, he told us that probably we are in front of psychosomatic symptoms. PTSD case was around 30 percent to 40 percent. We have seen people who are not going out from the home they live in for years and they are afraid even to venture out of the door. A lot of cases, yes. Hi, how are you? You cannot treat psychosomatic illness only with, with, with tablets or injections. You have to go to the community, you have to understand what's the problem of the community. You have to try to change something in the community. That's the only way to, to treat this kind of problems. Because as I told you, these are physical manifestations of psychological problems. Yes? Ah. Hi, Farhan. Zeta. Hi. Afwan. Cool. 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 الحمد لله ونصدق بمعركة خير ويا خير ويا ماذا حلوكي وحيوك ما شاء الله عدو يرون تاغا خير واتنا شغل جل هيا افتو سنتا خير هيا ايه وفا ديو ماذا حلوك ساكتاي هرد الانتي ايه هدا وصيحان السامر كان صوا الحمد لله الحمد لله خير ويا عندي ونصفير شي وحان السري لو بري ما لاحكين ما انت صوا صومر خير هذا هو فرح صنع ما شاء الله هذا سوق ما صنعت ما شاء الله ما شاء الله هذا هو فرح صنع ما شاء الله هذا هو فرح صنع
terrorism and insecurity in Kenya has been having a direct impact on the Somali refugees. Where many uh, terrorist attacks and terrorist threats in Nairobi, but also on the coast and throughout Kenya, again, uh, Somali refugees were being pointed at as responsible for insecurity. There is a lot of risk in Isili for the youth, vis-a-vis -vis radicalization and recruitment actually. There is a lot of risk in Isili and it's something that we, we know that is ongoing. Uh, youth are radicalized through preaching, uh, they are given narratives that connect to, to the suffering they undergo as youth, employment, poverty and all this. And many, many are believing the story. My, my job actually is information gathering. I'm the conduit between the government and the people. Yeah, every morning uh, I do my rounds to see if there, there are any problems, people being harassed because they are refugees. An indigenous Kenyan maybe has insulted or abused a refugee because they are not, uh, because they are strangers and they don't belong to this country. So we get a lot of those cases around here. I can imagine the refugee community complaining about lacking identity. They don't feel like they belong because they have not been made to feel they belong. And much of the work we do in this community is that uh, trying to tell the host community, the Kenyan people, that refugees are also people, and we need to accommodate them in the situation they are in right now. Uh, Dr. Alsami, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, how are you? How are you? I'm good, man. Welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you so much. How are you, my sister? Are you good? Yes. Yes. Everything is fine? Okay. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Yes. We can talk, yeah? Most of the time, these youth are becoming gangsters and hopeless because lack of identity. They create identity by joining gangs. That's why we decided to, to create an identity for them, to teach them Somali cultural dance, to teach them about the language even, to teach them about the past of Somalia, to teach them at least to create for them something to be proud of. Why the urban refugees are here? They, they have not made a, a choice to come. They've, they were forced at some point to leave their houses, their loved ones, everything that they had to, for their safety. And they've ended up in Nairobi. They could have ended up anywhere else. So it's not a choice to become a refugee. And uh, these people are extremely courageous and resilient. They fend for themselves. They work, most of them, in the informal sector, but they do work. Like anywhere else, the majority of the refugees are peaceful people. They're civilian. They're women, children. Uh, men who, who work very hard to make a living and to find a solution. And it's important to, to pass that message to the authorities.